board game breakfast. I am so glad to be on time this week and that I, my face is not quite as in so much pain. Thank you for all the nice messages. I know that there are many people and worse things happening to them uh, than a tooth that erupts or what have you, but um, I still appreciate that and the uh, the pain kept me from doing more reviews last week than I wanted to but we still got some out and hopefully we'll make up for that a little bit this week. Hey, we got some exciting things coming up. Obviously Origins is coming up next week um, so we're going to be still doing a board game breakfast next week um, but uh, I wanted to let you know that on our website on Tuesday we're going to have a schedule of the different things we're doing at Origins, and I hope that if you're gonna come by Origins at all, that you would make some plans to come by and say hi to us while we're there. We'll be there the entire time. Um, myself, Z Garcia, Eric Summer, and some of the other guys from the Dice Tower will be there, so hopefully you can come by and say hi. So check our website. On Tuesday, we'll be putting up our schedule for what's going on at Origins, so you have a chance to meet us there. Uh, also, today, Forbidden Stars will be happening tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Sam and I will be playing a two-player game of that. Uh, I think a four-player game would be entirely too long. And hopefully this will give you a good idea of what this upcoming game for Fantasy Flight is like. We'll be, he's playing Orcs, and I'm playing Eldar. Um, so this is the third time for me playing and the second time for Sam playing, so hopefully we get all the some of the rules right and all, but at least hopefully we give you an idea of what the game looks like and how it feels when playing. So come back and watch that live. Okay, and we'll, I'll be doing a question and answer, live question and answer thing, probably sometime later this week instead of doing it Monday since we're doing a live game. I'll announce that. Keep an eye out on our website at dicetower.com for information about that. Hey, it's time for the news. Let's go there. There's not much news this week, really. I'm sure Nick has plenty of Kickstarter news for you coming up in a moment, but there is some. Quinted Games is having their 10th anniversary. They started out by making, like, masterpiece collections of games, but they made some really great games. You can see some of them that I've reviewed. Um, but they're going to be coming out with a, a reprint of Carson City. Yeah! That's a great worker placement cowboy game. And they're also going to be bringing out a new expansion for it. So I'm happy with that. Um, also, they're printing Xanadu, which is a great little card game that I've talked about before, which didn't have very good quality. I'm sure that Quinn and Games will add that quality. Looney is making Flux the dice game because Flux did not have enough randomness in it. Um, and Orin the Boar is being reprinted. Yeah! Now, I mentioned Origins is coming up next week. Board Game Geek Eric Martin, the news editor there, has put together a geek list. You can go check that out. That shows all the upcoming games that will be released at Origins. Now, majority of them are Kickstarters that are being launched at Origins, so take those out in, them, in a sense because they're not really there. But there are a few games. I know Upper Deck has Bring Out Your Dead and things like that that will be released there, and we'll find out more as time goes by. Hey folks, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Today we have a question from a guy who runs a gaming event at his house. And he says he runs a gaming event at his house, he tells people what game they're playing, and then the people show up with bags of games. They play his game, and as soon as it's over, they want to play their games. And he's sitting there thinking, uh, you know, what if I want to, you know, I want people to play the games that I have, but at the same time he understands that they have games that they want to play too. So his question is, when you're hosting a game at your, event at your house, whose games do you play? Do you get to pick the games? Well, I'm at Tom's house all the time, so I never pick the games. In fact, <laughs> we only play whatever games he wants to play. I don't know why that is, but he's like, I've got this new game, we're going to have to play it, whether you like it or not. And that's what happens. Um, but if we're at a general place, then I would say that the best way is, you know, you shouldn't feel like I'm the host, we're only playing my games. The best thing would be, you know, figure it out. I know there's someone in our group who, his philosophy is, we, everyone puts out a game that they like, and then you roll a die, and whichever... You know, ah. This game is one to two, this game is three to four, and this game is five to six. But what if you don't like one of the games? Well, then I guess you're stuck with it at that point. But at least then everyone's getting a choice to put out a game that they like. So at least someone will get the game they like. It's better if you can come to a consensus anyway. But if you can't come to a consensus, then the best thing is probably to 
do that. Well, see, here's the thing. I, I really, you know, Jason said I make him play games, but the fact is, is when he comes over, I say, would you like to come over and play these games? It's not like I, I'm, I'm shell-shocking you when you get there. <laughs> um, the, way, the way I think that when you have people over to your house, you're the host, so they kind of follow your lead. If they say bring some games, we'll play games, and there has been times where I've had more than one people. I, if I'm running a self-contained thing, though, and say, hey, we'll do some games, we kind of talk about it a little bit ahead of time. Hey, we're going to play these games or whatever. Um, and sometimes things change, but I'm a big believer. If I go to someone else's house, I'll say, do you care if I bring some games? I'll ask them first. So I think the host has the final say, but at the same time, you want to make the group happy. If this is the only place you're playing games, then you probably want to share the wealth. But if it's just like a, like for me, my house is different than the gaming group, so it's, it works differently. Yeah, at the gaming group, there's a whole assortment of games, and a bunch of people say, these are the games, we're going to play this, this, and this, and you can assort easier. If there's only like three or four people, then, you know, I don't, well, I'm the kind of person I don't mind playing whatever gets pulled out. So Tom pulls out some new unreleased game and we just play it and it's not a big deal. Of course, going by this new philosophy, I think next time I'm going to bring a bag and just for Kabuki Kid, I'm going to pull out aliens and say, hey, can we do it this time? Finally. All right. Anyhow, what do you guys do? How do you decide who plays what games at when you're at someone's house, not at a gaming group? Let us know in the comments. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. In a world of Catan and Monopoly movies, two men dared to pitch better big screen board games. Red Dawn was a 1984 movie starring Patrick Swayze, Charlie Sheen, and Jennifer Grey that asked the question, what if the Soviet Union and its communist allies invaded the U.S.? Surely Red Dawn partly inspired the Milton Bradley game Fortress America. Fortress America has one player play the U.S. in a near-future scenario where one to three other players take control of communist forces invading the U.S. from the West, South, and East. Instead of pitching a movie for Fortress America, we've decided to present this as a gritty TV series inspired by shows like The Americans, Jericho, and Fallen Sky. Fortress America would start in 2031, a year after the initial invasion from the neo-Soviet-led forces. In the West, we would tell the story of partisans sowing discord among the supply lines of the neo-Soviets in and around Las Vegas. They are led by former casino enforcer Michael Shannon from Boardwalk Empire. In the South, our story would focus on the defense of San Antonio, where American military regulars fight alongside partisans. There's significant tension between the military general, played by Michael Kelly from House of Cards, and the civilian leader, played by Kerry Washington from Scandal. In the East, the neo-Soviets have almost total control of New York City, having put any suspected partisans in re-education camps. The partisans there, led by Rich Summer from Mad Men and the Cardboard Cast podcast, are trying to destabilize the neo-Soviet control and release their fellow freedom fighters. Finally, we'd get a look at the remnants of the American government. The president, played by Michael Kenneth Baker from The Wire, was the former Secretary of Labor, who was 11th in line to be president. The only remaining Joint Chief, played by Sigourney Weaver from Alien, believes that president is unfit to lead, and the resulting tension leads up to a coup attempt at the end of season one. Here's the tagline. Fortress America is breached. Is this a movie you'd like to see? Would you cast it differently? Let us know in the comments below. Until the next time, for the Dukes of Dice. Today we're taking a look at some stuff from Upended Games. Now this, today we're looking at pieces that they've made for one of my favorite games, Suburbia. Now in Suburbia, each person here has a spot where you have income and reputation and you keep track of these. And you know, like with any game, if this gets moved at all, they might move around. So one of the things Upended Games does is they have these plastic overlays here that simply go over the board and this just helps keep your things in track. Was that at a five or six? Well, it's pretty obvious it's at a five. And as you move these, these just keep these straight on the board. And I like that. I mean, obviously this moves around a little bit, but it's not a big deal. And it helps out very much. And so these are something I will use in my games. But what really gets me excited about this set are the bunches of tiles that they have. They have a, a little bag of tiles, and there's one for each uh, group. So here's the ones for stack B, and they got some over here for stack A. But let me show you exactly what these do. Let's say, for example, I build the Homeowners Association. Well, what I do is I put this token here on top of that. And this is a token that my opponents can easily see across the table. That's important because the Home Association gives me $2 anytime anyone builds a residential a house. And so this shows everybody that, hey, anytime someone builds one of those, I'm going to get $2. So, you know, you're, you're, people have to do it anyway. 
This is just a nice visual representation. Uh, another one here might be a municipal airport here. Well, I put on this, this double airplane symbol. Why? The white airplane shows it is an airport. The black airplane reminds people that anytime someone else builds an airport, I'm going to get an extra dollar. Again, these are just symbols that people can glance across the board. The fancy restaurant has the same thing. It gives you uh, a fork here, but it also makes you lose one for every restaurant that's built after this one. The fast food restaurant simply just has the white fork on it because it counts as a restaurant. So again, people can look and see how many restaurants are on the board. Or the slaughterhouse here, which is plus one for every restaurant, that one simply has the black fork and knife on it because that way people can look and say, ooh, I'm gonna build a restaurant, I'm gonna be giving Tom a point. And so these are just visual cues that they can look. And so you can see we have little suitcases here. We have things here for factories and he has the different of these buildings that are built, uh, different tokens here for all the different um, expansions for the game, even the upcoming five-star expansion, they have these pieces ready. And they're really nice because, again, there's a lot of little icons, and I think Suburbia is great as it is, but this lets me look across the board and can say, how many restaurants are there? Well, I can just look, at the, I'll look for the little fork and knives and see how many of those people have on their tokens. And since there's enough included when you get these for every tile in the game, it's a very simple addition and I really like how it looks visually. This is one of my favorite little additions to a game. It's definitely going in my box of Suburbia. Again, uh, I'll put a link in the description of Board Game Breakfast, but this is from Upended Games. So, as part of the 20th anniversary Gall Extravaganza, birthday for the game formerly known as Settlers of Catan, we've been talking about a couple of things. Notably, how you would ever make a movie based on Settlers, and ways in which the game is still great. But today we're going to talk about the one thing Settler does really badly. What Settlers does really badly is fight the rich get richer phenomenon. Now before Settlers came out, that was not even a thing. That was the explicit rhetorical motive behind creation of Monopoly, to teach kids that the rich get richer. But even more recently, there was that game Outpost, which came out in like 1991, where whoever gets ahead in the first round, they're going to win the game. Settlers tries to fight that phenomenon in three ways. Now, one mechanic is the robber. The idea is if one player is ahead, then all the other players who are behind will send the robber at him when they roll a seven, right? No, this is a bad mechanic, because the guy who's in first place probably has a soldier or two up his sleeve and will send the robber right back at you if you send it at him. So you don't send it at him, you send it at the person who's in last place, because he can't get revenge on you. Second mechanic is that when a 7 is rolled, you lose half the cards in your hand. No, this is also a bad mechanic, and it hurts the players who are behind far more than it hurts the players who are ahead. The player who's ahead probably doesn't have a surplus of cards. You're winning because you spent all your cards last turn, but the guy in last place is stuck with three worthless brick and five completely worthless sheep. The third mechanic is trading. If someone gets ahead, then all the other players who are behind stop trading with him. This is a decent mechanic. However, if nobody's really trading at all in the game, then it doesn't matter at all. So, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Settlers, for 20 fabulous years. Without you, none of us would probably be here. We'd probably still be stuck playing crappy games like Monopoly and Outpost. <laughs> Like I said, I got some Dice Tower productions. Obviously, the big review this week is going to be that of Forbidden Stars. Sam and I will be doing a review of that later on this week. I got Dark Seas from AEG coming. Uh, some of the bookcase games from Yellow. Uh, some small card games. Uh, you'll see it. I got some reviews from Dan and the rest of the guys and from Z. We have a top 10 list coming out this week. The top 10 enemies of gaming. Who are these enemies? What are these enemies? Find out later this week. And so that's all coming up. And then, of course, our show, the Dice Tower Podcast. If you've never listened to our audio show, I recommend you do that, myself and Eric Summer. But not just our show. There is a plethora of great shows that are part of the Dice Tower Network. And you can find all the information about that at Dicetower.com. Chaz 
Marler from Paradise Paradise. Recently, I discussed collectible card games, using Magic the Gathering as an example of the concept. Then I moved on to living card games, using AEG's Doomtown Reloaded as an example of that concept. Well, today, I round out the trilogy by discussing the expandable card game, or ECG. Now, what's an example of an ECG? Well, AEG's Doomtown Reloaded is one. W wait a minute. Didn't I use Doomtown Reloaded as an example of the LCG concept? I did! What's the difference? What's going on here? Isn't Doomtown Reloaded an LCG? Well, technically, no, it's not. And the reason why AEG's Doomtown Reloaded is called an expandable card game, and not a living card game, is simply because Fantasy Flight Games had the foresight to trademark the phrase living card game. So, even though other companies' games, such as Doomtown Reloaded, utilize the exact same common concept of being a card game that more cards are added to over time, only Fantasy Flight may use the phrase living card game to describe them. But whoa, 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 don't go getting upset with Fantasy Flight for arbitrarily staking a claim to a descriptive phrase in what could be seen by some as an attempt to stifle competitive innovation within the industry. No, no, no. If anything, they didn't go far enough. For example, even if Fantasy Flight was to continue cleverly trademarking the phrases that describe their products, such as space opera, dungeon crawl, or poorly written rulebook, they still, in my opinion, dropped the ball by neglecting the opportunity to also patent their unique and original concept. Similar to what Wizards of the Coast did with their long-held patent on the total innovation of tapping a playing card by rotating it 90 degrees. A patent is intended to protect a unique invention or process, which makes Wizards of the Coast's patent all the more brilliant, since the concept of card rotation is neither unique nor inventive. But I'm not letting this get me down. Just the opposite. All of this has inspired me to announce my own upcoming lucrative patents on several concepts related to board games. Haha! <laughs> now, the gaming industry juggernauts out there may not like this, but I'm not going to let them intimidate me. You hear me? No, that's right. I'm Chaz Marler, and you will not silence me because I... Whoa, sorry, I got pretty carried away there. Well, I'm Chaz Marler. See you next time. And it's time to talk again about some great expansions, and now we're in the top 40. Yeah! The first expansion is Freshly Spiced, which is an expansion for Usurp or, or, or Soup, or as it was called later, Primordial Soup. Now, you may not have heard of this game, which is unfortunate because it was a really fun game about having these amoebas that evolved, and you would get like different mutation genes, and they'd go around and attack each other or do different things. Um, there was different strategies that you could do, but what Freshly Spiced did is it brought in a whole pile of mutant genes. It also added the fifth and sixth player, which was okay. Um, and maybe if you wanted other colors, that was neat, but it added these new genes. Now, you didn't want to throw them all in because it would just be too confusing, but you added a few of them in and it added a lot of variety to the game. I already thought the game was pretty neat, um, but there were some people sitting their ways like, I'm always going to buy this gene, I'm going to buy this gene. What if those genes aren't available in this game, or what if this gene's there to combat that? Some, some, there was a couple crazy genes in the set, but I still enjoyed it. Then we have the reinforcement packs for Summoner Wars. Now, Summoner Wars was a great game. You got your pack, I got, you had your army, I had my army, we played against each other. So neat how balanced, one of my favorite games ever. Reinforcement packs came out, and I was like, all right, fine, deck building. I like deck building, but I didn't think that Summoner Wars needed it, and then I did it. Deck building simple. You have 18 common units, you have three champions, you have to use the starting units on the card, and that's it. 
Okay, that's fine. How many different units are there? Well, there really isn't that many. I have six champions to pick from now. Ooh, that's not so bad. And it really isn't. You can deck build in this game in literally minutes, and yet it added so much variety because I was never quite sure what you brought in your deck. I knew like you know how your deck works a little bit. I know the possible champions you have, but I thought that the, these reinforcement packs really elevated Summoner Wars and took it from being a great game to a <laughs> exceptionally great game. Then we have City Gates expansion for Alhambra. Now Alhambra has five different expansions, maybe more, but I've played the first five expansions. They're numbered one, two, three, four, five. Each expansion comes with four modules. I have reviewed all these expansions and I've ranked all the modules from one to 20. There's 20 different modules. Easily, head and shoulders above the rest, expansion number two, the City Gates, is my favorite because the four modules in it, I like them all. Some of the modules I thought were okay, some of that, but in expansion two, the City Gates, I like the City Gates, which lets you basically ignore walls in the city. I like Diamonds, which added another wild currency. Really enjoyed that one. I like characters, special characters that did things. That was a great little uh, module. And then I really enjoyed the camps that outside. That's my my favorite mini expansion for the module for the game. I just enjoyed all of them. And I always say if you get one expansion, get that one because I enjoyed all the modules of it. Added a lot of variability to Alhambra. Dominion Intrigue was the first expansion for Dominion. Uh, and this, it's on the list almost for that reason alone. I like Dominion. Everyone liked Dominion. We played it, we played it, we played it. Lots of variety, but after a while I was like, okay, we want to see some more cards. Is there more coming? And Dominion Intrigue came out. Yes! Now it's not my favorite Dominion expansion, but I still think it's a very solid one. It added cards that were two different types, an action card and a victory point card. It added more victory point cards to the, the set. It added just different... None of the cards in Intrigue are like showstoppers for me, although, well, Bridge is pretty cool. But I mean, the, the, none of them are get cards that I'm, maybe are my favorite cards, but it added so many different ones and really upped the variety of the game to me. And just also, it did something really cool in which it was a self-contained set where you could just buy Intrigue and play with that. And so I thought that was a nice touch because people could still get into Intrigue and then go back and buy the base game as an expansion to some degree which was a pretty neat idea, Dominion Intrigue. And finally, the last one we're talking about today is a Cosmic Encounter expansion, Incursion. Now, Incursion was the first Cosmic Encounter expansion, and it's on this list for that reason, because it added the sixth player to the game. Now, eventually all the expansions added that six, which could be the seventh or eighth player, but Cosmic Encounter is good with five, great with five. It is superb with six. Six is my favorite number of players to play Cosmic Encounter with, and that alone puts us on the list. But it also added a pile more aliens to the set, the Leviathan and some other cool aliens. And I was like, oh, this is great. Cosmic's going to get even better. I was really happy with the base game, but an expansion added more. I didn't really care about the Cosmic Quakes as much. Oh, they're not terrible, and I like them, but the addition of the sixth player and the more aliens easily added this to my list. Whew. We're almost in the top third of my gaming expansions. Come back next week, and we'll talk about some more. Hey, everybody. Steve here, and here's your AFR two-minute drill. So this week, I wanted to talk about what appears to be the year of the upgrades in the sports game world. So far this year, there's been four really big ones that I've been following. Replay Games has put out an update for their Replay Basketball game. They're just now rolling out one for Replay Baseball. And then over at Play.com, they put out a very significant upgrade for their second season football game. And also for History Maker Baseball, they put out version 4.0. Now, in the sports board game world, generally, when an upgrade comes out, it represents a significant change in the game components, but you are still able to use all of your old game seasons that you bought for that game, so you're not completely replacing everything that you previously had. And I was curious to find out what people's thoughts are when a new edition of a game comes out. Do you jump right on the wagon? Or do you wait for a while and hold on to your, your old version? As for myself, with sports board games, it's usually a no-brainer to pick up that new edition of the game that comes out. But with other board games, 
I'd like to think that I would have a little restraint, but I can't help but think of something like my almost pristine copy of Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition sitting on my shelf. And yet, if a 4th edition were announced, I would probably be one of the first people in the line to pre-order that. So let us know your thoughts on how you feel about new versions of games coming out and how quick you are to pick them up. Until next time, my name's Steve, and you've been watching the AFR 2-Minute Drill. Do you have any sevens? Go fish. You know, Evil Cody, I've been thinking. There's a lot of IPs out there. Uh, books, uh, movies, TV shows that would probably make excellent board and card games. Any twos? Go fish. Like what? What kind of IPs would you like to see made into board and card games? Do you have any nines? Go fish. I would really love to see a board game based on Isaac Asimov's Foundation novels. I mean, could you imagine a grand, sprawling space adventure with that Foundation theme? Oh, oh yes. How about an Andy Griffith show deck building game? Oh, uh, I played the bullet card from Barney's gun. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. Opie told the truth. Draw two cards. <laughs> oh, no. I got the NP card. Negative victory points. I'd actually like to see a, a board or a card game based on George MacDonald Frazier's Flashman novels. I mean, I don't know exactly how that would work, but the, but the books are so funny and full of adventure, you think they'd lend themselves pretty well to some kind of a game. What about a renegade game? You remember Renegade with Lorenzo Lamas? Whatever happened to Lorenzo Lamas? If only people were watching us right now and they had their own ideas about what IPs would make a, a great board game or a card game, I'd love to hear from them. Maybe they could, I don't know, leave a comment in some sort of imaginary comment section down below. Any ones? Go fish. I, I think we're playing this game wrong. Folks, we review a lot of games at the Dice Tower. And when I first started reviewing games, I had a reputation of being too positive. Everyone said, Tom, you like everything. And there's different reasons for that. One was because I was buying all my games and I would go look at games I was interested in and buy them. So obviously I tended to like more games than I didn't, although I did not like everything. I certainly did not do all positive reviews. There's lists out there of games I do not like. And I think I've shaken that reputation to some degree because I don't have many people say that to me today. When we do different reviews, we do positive and negative reviews, our negative reviews always bring back backlash. And in fact, we get some severe backlash these days, especially when we review a Kickstarter game negatively. In fact, there's a Kickstarter game out there right now that I'm a little nervous about reviewing because the game has gotten universally positive reviews to it, and it's just in my opinion, not good at all, and I'm afraid almost of, I'm, I'll be putting my review of it, not this week, but next week, and it's a very negative review of this game, and, I'm, and I know the fans are going to jump all over us about it, but that's life, okay? That doesn't bother me that much, although, you know, I'm like, okay, here we go, put on your armor, Vassal, because those negative reviews bring at it in most people, and Z did one last week of Hogger Logger, and there's this closed Facebook group of board game reviewers, it can't be that close, though, there's like 1,200 people in it. Did you know there's that many reviewers? But anyway, they went to town on Z for his negative review of that because they all said that they like many of the reviewers liked the game and they didn't understand how he thought the game was that bad. I'll give you a hint, he was right. But anyhow, one of the people there said something effective, well the review wasn't very objective. And so I thought, oh yeah, you know, we get that a lot. Your reviews aren't objective. So I thought I would address that. We're not objective. <laughs> We're not, you know, we, we don't really, I don't even necessarily strive to be that. Now, I like to take objectivity to some degree. Okay, we want to look at a viewpoint. Who's this game for? What's it meant for? We play a kid's game and I'm like, oh, I cannot believe this kid's game did not hold my attention long. Well, no, it was made for kids. So I play it with kids. The miniature game, I might be like, oh, I can't believe this game had a 60 page rule book. Well, it was a miniatures game. It was clearly delineated that way. And especially when games are clearly delineate themselves a specific way, like, hey, this game's for kids, then it should be reviewed that way. 
But when it comes and we look at a game, we have to look at it through our likes and dislikes. And I so firmly believe that it's important for the reviewer to be very clear about what they like and dislike. Now, some reviewers insist that they will only review games they like, and that's fine. And, and everyone can have their own philosophy on that. And, and I, don't, I don't dislike that, but that reviewer is not so helpful to me personally because I want to know what you like and what you don't like. And I think it's important to be passionate about both things. If I'm going to sit and rave about how wonderful a game is, and you're going to see me rave about a game this week. There's a game I played this week that I just love, all right? And I'm going to say that in the review about how much I enjoy that game. Well, then I think I should go to that same extreme to tell you about games that I loathe, games that I do not like. Now, I get very passionate about everything. I could spend you a long time talking about why I like certain kinds of ice creams and don't like them, and why um, certain medicines for tooth make me mad because they don't take the pain away. But I, I, I think that it's important to look at a game through my veneer. If I don't like a certain mechanism, I don't care if that's a bias I go into the game. If I think a theme really irritates me that this theme is in a the game, I'm gonna go in with that bias. I cannot set those biases aside and I don't even try to set them aside. But at the same time, I'm not hiding them from you. Let's say there's a game and this has been all in the rage and I don't wanna get into the, the big debate that's been going on against, about Cards Against Humanity. But Cards Against Humanity is an incredibly vulgar game. I have no interest in playing vulgar games, all right? That's something that people probably know at this point, although some publishers do not know this and try to get me to play their new vulgar, hey, it's just like Cards Against Humanity style game. People know that I don't like that, and if I get a game with that in it, and even if it's in it slightly in it, and I do manage to play it for whatever reason, I'm gonna mention it, and it's going to be a factor in why I probably don't like that game. If there's a game that, you know, the theme is problematic or I, I hate a certain mechanism, maybe the game you know, has a catch-up mechanism that's artificial and I hate that in games. If that's in a game, I'm going to mention that because that's a personal dislike that I have. I, I used to think about this because I, I would read reviews by the late Roger Ebert and he always almost always complained about 3D, right? He'd say, I saw this in 3D. I didn't like the 3D. I hated the 3D. Man, why did I use 3D in movies, right? And I thought, why? I mean, if you don't like it, we get it. You don't like it. But you know what? It was important because I remember when Avatar came out, he said the 3D was good. And another one, he, he said 3D. And I, and I took note of that. So I think it's important when a reviewer looks and says, I don't like, let's say they don't like war games. But then the war game comes out and they're like, oh, this was pretty fun. I suddenly go, huh? And that's why I think it's so important for reviewers, and that's why I strive to do it with myself, and I push my other reviewers on the show to do the same thing, is to get out there and say, we like this, we don't like this, so that when suddenly we say, ooh, you know, I actually did like this. I mean, when Sam said he liked Caverna, people sat up and took note, because he did not like Agricola. And when, I, when we say that we like something, and other people are like, whoa, I thought you don't normally like stuff like that. That makes it a bigger deal. There are some reviewers out there who essentially are just rubber stamps. And I'm not talking about board games in, gen in specific, it's just reviewers in general for everything, okay? Because even those bad movies, when you go buy them from the bargain bin, on the back there's reviewers who've given them great reviews, two thumbs up and all. There's people out there who say good things about everything. And those people are of zero use to me because you like everything. I was reading actually a board game reviewer this week and he gave the game a nine out of 10, nine out of 10, eight out of 10, nine out of 10. I was like, wow, that's really cool. But I looked and all the reviews were like that. Well, how is that useful? Well, same thing here. But we cannot be objective. There is no possible way to look at a game clinically and take out all my likes and dislikes and I don't wanna. I don't wanna. I want the Dice Tower to be a human show, to be a show about people. I always tell people when they meet me and they're like, I hope that when you meet me, that you meet me and you say, hey, you're just like you are on the show. And that's what I want. I want this not to be some persona, Tom Vassell, but you to get to know the real Tom Vassell so that my likes and dislikes can help you. And so that even if you absolutely 100% disagree with me, and many people do, if I hate a game, you can go, oh, well, then I'll like it. And if I like a game, well, then you go, oh, I'll, well, maybe I won't like that one. That's fair. And that's, I hope, is helpful to people. Not to mention the fact that if I dislike a game you like, 
Um, it doesn't say anything about you as a person, but that's a whole different thing, and I've talked about that in the past. But anyhow, just again, as a clarification, we're not objective here at the Dice Tower, and we're not striving to be either. In the middle of April, Alan Moon of Ticket to Ride fame held his annual Gathering of Friends. Now, for those of you who haven't heard of this, it is an invitation-only gaming convention for people in the industry. Game designers, publishers, journalists, uh, people who run board game cafes, and the like. First up, Fun Farm. Now, anyone who's been to Snakes and Lattes knows that we love the game Ghost Blitz from Zoc. And I think that Fun Farm might just be the next Ghost Blitz for us. It's by Luca Bellini and Yellow Games. Players compete to earn the most cards by grabbing up these adorable sponge animals. Every turn, a player adds a new animal card to the center and then rolls the dice. If one of the dice matches one of the two dice shown on any of the cards, players must grab the animal shown on that card. Fast, fun, and squishy. Next up is Kobayakawa, designed by Jun Sasaki and published also by Yellow Games. This is best described as poker light. Each player is dealt one card and gets to take one action before deciding whether or not to bet that they can win the round. Before anyone gets to act, however, the Kobayakawa card is revealed. This card's value is added to the value of the betting player who reveals the lowest numbered card in hand. Your action options are to either draw a card to hand and then discard one of your two cards face up for everyone to see, or you simply flip over the top card of the deck and it becomes the new Kobayakawa. Kobayakawa. It's poker light and it rocks. And finally I present Toy Vault's But Wait, There's More by Friends of the Cafe, Sen Fung Lim, and Jay Cormier. It's kind of like what would happen if snake oil was designed by gamers. Every round, a single product card is revealed. A horse, scissors, a magnifying glass, whatever. And each player attempts to make a sales pitch for that thing. The catch is, each player uses a feature card from their hand as the cornerstone of their pitch. Now for the fine print. Partway through your pitch, another feature card is randomly revealed and you must incorporate that into your sales pitch. After everyone is gone, players use voting cards to judge the other players' pitches. You don't vote on your own. And that's it, folks! Thanks so much for watching Board Game Breakfast. I'm so glad you guys stuck with us last week, even when we were a day late, and I appreciate that. Come back later today to watch our live playthrough. Come back this week as we put out different reviews and top 10 lists. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.